morning, everybody. It's December 10th, 2021. I'm Charlie Fink. I'm here with my partner in crime, Ted Chilowitz, and our friend, Roni Abovitz. Welcome to This Week in XR. Um, good morning, guys. Roni just hey, put Charlie. up his, uh, his, his AR lens effect to uh, welcome us into the future. So there's, there's a lot of news to get to today. Um, Meta, the company formerly known as Facebook, has thrown the doors open to its big VR world, Horizon Worlds. And uh, Epic Games gave us a taste of a virtual city uh, dressed up as a matrix promotion, Um, but the city has been created with great detail and will be part of Unreal Engine 5. So, you know, we will see it in a lot of games uh, and probably a lot of movies too. Uh, Supposedly you could explore it for days and not get more than a few blocks. It's filled with um, virtual people and AI that are like on walk cycles, they're getting onto trains, they're you know going into buildings, uh, and and they're all attached to the chaos engine, um, so that you can do anything to them, uh, good good and bad. So I really can't wait for that. Uh, and of course, there's some uh, new Apple rumors. So always great to get your perspective on that, gentlemen. Uh, so first of all. Uh, I, I didn't mention your company, Sun and Thunder, Roni. What's going on with that? Are we going to learn more about that soon? Um, we, we might have news in 22, but uh, that's all I'll say now. <laughs> very, right. very fictitious, <laughs> Roni. All it. right. Uh, so, Ted, uh, have you yes. spent any time in Horizons? I have. I am, I am you know, a part of the beta crew like you are, so I've been in it and I've been watching its evol- evolution, and we've you know, been doing a lot of stuff with our friends at Meta, and... Uh, uh, to your point, in, in a column that you wrote this week, uh, now they've opened it up and essentially shown the new sort of skinning and the new um, avatar um, build system, which is really good and, and effective, albeit not, you know, it's they're leaning very much into the cartoon side of this, not the photo oh, yeah. side. Oh, yeah. Right? Um, and it you have to kind of uh, accept their, their guardrails, their boundaries on what they're capable of doing right now. Um, it is very quest-focused, right? It is very... Sort of, if you're a VR person, you're going to enjoy Horizons, but so far, nothing beyond that yet. That's their sort of future aspirations. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's, it's a good step. And, you, you know, you were mentioning what's happening on the counter side of that or the, the, the mesh side of that with Unreal. And the fact that it's hard for a lot of people, even us, three of us, to really grasp what is going to happen with the visualization and the creation of this metaverse. And is it even possible to move from this web 2.0, a bunch of disparate websites that all sort of interconnect in, in odd ways to a sort of unified structure of lots of different things. And here comes Epic saying, not only is it possible sometime in the future, it's possible now and we're doing it and we're doing it at scale and we're delivering this sort of like, like I keep referring to the, the, the future of Second Life. You know, Philip Rosedale mm-hmm. was really the pioneer of this mm-hmm. concept. And now when you look at what Epic has done with their matrix sort of deliverable and then what's gonna happen with that. Uh, it's clear that we have the technical capabilities to pull this off now. Um, <clears throat> Roni, have you spent any time in there? In which We one? were talking uh, in Facebook Horizon. I, I will probably not, uh, not <laughs> enter that. There, not like there's some, there's some countries I think I may not visit. I'll be okay. <laughs> so if you think of like these, these uh, experts things as different countries, I, I may not cross that border and I think I'll, I'll be fine. So for for your benefit, uh, Ted mentioned some of the things uh, about it. Uh, First of all, I mean, it's got a very well thought out and well executed aesthetic, both with the avatar system as well as the palette of the world, which is very pastel, very colorful, and they have annoying xylophone music playing that you cannot shut off. You can't shut off. It's a little crazy. Yeah. And, um, And it... It, it feels very Disney to me, I have to say. Part of it is the level at which it's executed and the attention to detail. Part of it is its uniformity, right? When you go to Disney, you just accept everything and let it entertain you. And you really have to do the same thing in Horizon. And I will also say this, because I've spent time there with a bunch of executives. Um, they're excited. They are very genuinely passionate about the thing that they're building. And even if I don't completely love what they're building, I love that they love it. 
that, that was a great quality that people had when they were working with Magic Leap. They felt like they were on a mission. And uh, that is palp palpable when you speak with them. That is the, the number one takeaway I have is that they like spending time in Horizon. Right. Charlie, I do have to mention for our ever-growing group of listeners, they are uh, listening to Pandemic Dog Effect, which is a worldwide phenomenon now. Uh, so oh, good. Just... <laughs> Hang on. You, you guys will enjoy this. We'll, we'll talk. Teddy. For, you know, Teddy. Talk amongst yourselves. Uh, and Charlie's dog is named Teddy, of course, so uh, no relation to exactly. me. Exactly. I named him after you, then. Hey. By the way, this is, I think, what people love about what we do with the podcast. It's very <laughs> unvarnished, as it were. I feel, like, I feel like I should bring my, I have like six dogs. Yeah, so you I should like just bring them to the party. Yeah, it's like the, he thinks the, he's the a whole guard dog. Of what life is has changed, right? So. Well, he, he thinks he's a guard dog. Charlie, since you brought up Disney, I think one of the interesting things is, I mean, there, it's, there's been some public signaling from Disney now that uh, all the metaverse stuff is so present uh, you know, you can't assume they've been asleep at the wheel. So it does seem like all hands are on deck over there on something. I don't think they're going to say anything about it until it happens, but I, you have to imagine that like that, that they're going to react to like, you know, potential competitive threats by, by companies formerly known as Facebook and others to replicate what they do versus like them doing what they do uh, in, in, in the full on way. So I feel like that's going to be interesting when they unfold it. And it's going to be interesting to see like where they put it, you know, what they do it on. Is it Unreal? Build their own engine. And, you know, are they going to do it through an Apple headset or something else? Because that, that to me is where it gets really interesting. Like what, what does Disney do? And I think that'll set a standard. Yeah, well, I think Charlie there's, I, there's two. Sorry, go ahead. Dan. As a Charlie and I talked about this a number of times privately, and it's no reason not to talk about it publicly, um, as you know, even though I work for a competitive studio, as a huge fan of Disney and, and Disney culture, Disney as an entity, um, you know, I have this belief structure that Disney's always been in the metaverse and they've always yes. used whatever yes. the technology of the day yep. was in Walt's life and then post Walt's life um, to accomplish this goal of mixed reality, of blending the real and the fantastical in a place that was universally understood, accepted, and loved in various ways. So it would make sense that they would explore this and find their own unique voice as opposed to just sort of following the other kind of voices in the space. Ted, I think you just nailed something very important. Like if you, if you move away from the term metaverse, which is very particular to this blending of the real and fantastical or real and creative, that's been something that predates Snow Crash, that predates a lot of things, you know, Charlie the Chocolate Factory, uh, you know, all, all the things from Disney. Back I mean, then. how about every dark ride that ever was made? Every, every dark ride, fantastic <clears throat> in the 1800s. So it feels like, I feel like creative teams with creative DNA will actually have an advantage. And it's a little interesting that tech companies that have not had a creative bone are trying to emulate those companies. But I wonder how much pretzel bending they need to do to actually do this because it's not what they are. It's not what they grew up doing. It's, I mean, they may, they may try to import it in, but culturally they're not built that way. Right. Um, and, and, you know, they might metamorphosize into something else, but uh, a lot of these tech companies are gigantic that are not funneling money into these like creative fantasy worlds. It's not what they are. Whereas like with Epic, I absolutely grew up as a, you know, it's a gaming company. They grew up in like Tim's basement, Disney, hundred percent, the DNA, but I do wonder about tech companies that are pretending to be creative and what that really will feel like versus like when you really have artists and creative people building these things. I, you know, do you want to see a film made by a bunch of tech people? Do you want to see a film made by creative geniuses? Right. I think this will be like, you know, and, and you want to live in a world made by, you know, sort of people who are on one side of the spectrum or the other. It's going to be interesting. Uh, what I was going to say about uh, Disneyland and Disney in particular is uh, at virtual Disneyland makes total sense, right? You just try and replicate the place and the thrill of being the, in the place and perhaps even charge people to get into it if it's really that good. And then the other thing, of course, is when there are augmented reality glasses and, and even before then uh, on smartphones, you can imagine people going to a place like Galaxy's Edge and having it be a mixed reality experience that they're just sharing with a massive group of other people that is persistently, you know, attached to that location where also, you know, we were talking earlier, you know, they could do diminished reality and disappear all the other people. 
right? They can, you could look up and all of a sudden now there are three moons during the day, you know? So, so the, um, the creative freedom that comes with controlling the world to that extent uh, is certainly something that we will see. I'm not positive in our lifetimes at this point, but I, I think it's clearly what the technology will enable for a creative, a giant creative concept. Totally agree. So um, getting, getting back to the news, um, the week has been bubbling over with Apple rumors. Uh, again. So now, again, and you know, the, the thing is about these rumors, they start to accumulate uh, and they, the drumbeat is steady enough that even though I have no firsthand information myself, uh, you know, you start to get a picture of, of what is probably happening. Uh, but you have more, you guys have more perspective on this. I mean, 2022, really? Well, Roni, see if you would agree with this thesis. Do you agree that what Apple does really well is allow everyone else to stumble around in the dark, to see glimmers of light, but more than not stumble around making their mistakes. And Apple watches from the sidelines very smartly, very cautiously, and learns from everyone else's resources and time and energy. And these days, it's these very large tech giants that are often their direct competition. They watch and they think and they postulate. And then they decide to enter the market when the stumbling phase is over. And we are still in the stumbling phase, even though we're not taking huge stumble mistakes anymore. We're taking minor stumble mistakes anymore as we commercialize VR in the beginnings of MR. Would you agree with that generally, I, that that's Apple's take? Yeah, I think that's what they've become. Instead of leading, I think they just follow, copy, learn, but then put insanely large resource, like you know the, the largest possible engineering hardware software resource on the planet, add something to take it to a level of perfection that outpaces most players. I mean, what I, what I hear is that they're in the 10 to 15 billion per year investment in this. That's just such a massive amount of money. And, and for how many years, we're not totally sure. And for how many more years, but let's say they've put 30 to 60 billion in before something launches. The issue is it better be really good. It can't be like, it's a little better than the quest and everything I'm hearing through like the, let's call it the, the rumor uh, do, you know, that appears on the leaves in the morning through all sorts of uh, sources <laughs> is that they're definitely leaning at like some kind of Oculus thing, you know, some basically like a VR system that's maybe a little better, um, looks like an Apple product and has passed through VR. So you're looking through really good Apple cameras, but you're not looking at the world directly. It'll have a nice field of view. It'll have its like fancy chip and good batteries. But you know, it's not clear that that will ship. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure they've built it. But I think one of the questions, I don't think they want to ship something that has a adverse effect on people. And what I mean by that is like, there's no doubt VR causes some people to feel nauseous, but no Apple yes. product's ever done that. Yes. You know, like, like they can't afford that. You know, the, like yes. you wear the watch, it doesn't do something to you, right? So I know what you have to solve to get through that. And I wonder, Will they, have, will they have solved that or will they abandon an ethic in order to ship in the time frame everyone's thinking or is it just rumors and I'll just wait and wait and wait until they totally nail it. By the way, totally nailing it may cost all these tens of billions. Right. Yeah, finally absolutely. The whole population. So I just don't know. I mean, like it's easy for them to ship something a little better than, than an Oculus, but it's not easy for them to solve the fundamental issues that everyone knows you have to solve but kind of ignores they can't ignore it. I think their brand can't ignore it. Right. Well, and you as, the, as, as one of the absolute defined <laughs> pioneers in this space knows a lot about this, uh, knows you know, what it took. And the amount of criticism you got for the amount of money that was raised is kind of fascinating in the low building. Considering it's just a fraction of what was really required. Well, it's what the guys were talking about are spending probably every Every quarter, right? Every quarter, now. right, 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 right. Which is which is mind-boggling, right? Like to th yeah, yeah. And what, Charlie? You're, you're, I think they will ship something good. I mean, that's at the end of the day. I think they have a reputation for shipping something good, and I'm actually excited to see, like, in the VR space, 
I think they're actually going to wait a long time until like this, like what I have and you have. I think they're yeah. going to wait, wait, wait. Maybe that's like mid-decade or later. Mm -hmm. But I feel like they want to get on the VR train and VR yeah. with like, you know, pseudo AR with pass through because they, they just can't right. let, you know, the former Facebook run away with that. I think they feel that's strategically dangerous. It's going to be interesting, though, because then it'll be Apple fighting them. And then it's going to be a that, that could be a fight to the death. That could be really interesting what happens there. Yeah. Uh, well, there's no question that that having two big companies in this space is going to, um, you know, create uh, a lot of more choice than we have today. Uh, I, I also think I'm very excited about. Uh, it's not contained in the current rumors, but in previous rumors, there was this notion that that it would have retina scanning technology and adjust the lenses perfectly to your prescription, uh, and it would know the context. So not only does it know that. I'm half blind, but it knows when it's dark and it needs to adjust. It knows when I'm standing in the sunlight. And you know, unlike photosensitive lenses, which are dumb, you know, these lenses would would be smart because they'd know uh, what I was looking at and um, you know how they needed to optimize that. So if that you know that to me is an argument for an all day, every day. They probably uh, won't be product. the first. I can yeah. almost guarantee you they're not the first to ship what you just described. Right. I agree. And also what I just described is probably incredibly hard. Yeah. And there's also, um, you know, some speculation that I've been reading about the concept of a Mac on your face, right? So they may not necessarily be focusing down the gaming portal because Apple has traditionally not really succeeded in that realm. And they've tried a number of ways and it's not really their DNA. It's not really their strength, right? Um, but the Mac is, you know, in all of its forms and all of its functionality and what it does is, of course, a massive success in, you know, worldwide domination and of, of all the form factors of various size screens that we have in our lives. The small, medium, um, you know, the, the, the large, medium, small and tiny, right, from the desktop to the laptop to the tablet to the phone to the watch. Um, so the idea of, of, and there's been, you know, some like interesting, almost public comments from Tim Cook and others about the end of the smartphone, that the, that the days of the smartphone as a, a candy bar sort of, you know, holdable device are numbered. And they are now working on wearing all the things that we used to hold or set up on a desk or set up on a pedestal somewhere. And that is a very interesting postulation, something to think about across this 10 year journey, not just the next 18 right. months. Ted, what do you think about price point and Charlie? Like, because they're they clearly don't come in at the low end; they come in at the thousands of dollars, probably. And how do you think it's, that's what? It's things? it's a first adopter device. All these devices are first adopter devices. I don't think uh, Apple, as you said, I think it it probably will be a very very high quality headset, and they'll charge accordingly. I would not be surprised if it was fifteen hundred dollars, and I and I don't think the first people to buy them will care. Yeah, maybe, I think it might more. actually be maybe more than that for the first one, um, because they're actually looking to find the seating, the, the plant of who's going to use it and what kind of definition it will have in the marketplace. And then by a second or third gen product, uh, it will still be a, like kind of a luxury price product compared to the segment. But again, that's like you don't have to stretch too far to know that that's again within Apple's story. Apple likes to build things with extraordinarily refined engineering and target it to a customer that is willing to pay for that. What's interesting, Charlie, is I, I kind of know what you need to do if you're them with the amount of money and what it would take and when. And, and my, my thing is like, that's probably closer to like 2025. That's what I thought. That's why these so things if, percolate if up. Ship, I mean, if they, they need content, we haven't heard a peep about content. Very few developers know what they're doing. Are they going to buy Epic? You know, like they need to do something like that. Like, I mean, I could imagine them buying Unity and then, yes. you know, merging that with this, that would make sense. But like, if yep. they don't do that, um, they, you know, they still have a lot of power to pull all kinds of developers on board, but I, I wonder they they can't afford to ship something below the impossible standard that's now been built up in people's minds. Because if what they ship is worse than what smaller companies shipped four years ago, that's gonna look horrible, right? They have to be like years ahead so, you know, I kind of know like what certain things are going to be shipping next year. So they, they need to be like five times better than that, 10 times. And, and I wonder like, will they really be able to achieve that? Like in 2022, are they going to be, hey, we've spent $40 billion, it's only 10% better. So, I mean, it just has to be like, oh my God, the, 
you have to feel like you're now in the matrix, you're now in the oasis, and that's just not going to happen next year. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. Is Microsoft, guys, do you think Microsoft is going to be a player or is it going to be a duopoly between Apple and Facebook or is Microsoft going to crash the party? Don't count them out. Don't count I agree them. with Rodi. Do not count Katya them out. Katya is, no. is not a pushover. I've met the guy. He's smart as heck. He's tough as heck. You have to admire what he's done. That guy's a fighter. I've had to fight against him. Also sat down and had friendly, friendly <laughs> exchanges with him. But, you know, it's like you're fighting against a 10 million pound gorilla. I mean, th these guys are incredibly smart. They know how to play very complicated games and they're totally not get, They can't lose this. I mean, right. Charlie, they, they've lost the mobile phone. They cannot. Right, exactly. It. And and by the way, the company form, formerly known as Meta also did. Uh, they were a very young company at that time and unable to compete on that level, but they very much feel and have said repeatedly and consistently over the past few years that they want a platform play, that VR to them is a platform play that they did not have in mobile, which has made their business extremely vulnerable. And, and we see today some of the results of that where Apple can affect their bottom line basically at a whim. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's a lot of what's motivating them. So we're looking at not at a duopoly though, but at a, at a richer field with more players, including Microsoft and perhaps others. That's right. Charlie, I had a, I had an interesting thing that I don't, I don't see many people have talked about at all, but like the internet was really evolved from like government subsidy and yes. therefore had some level of openness and companies built on it. But what people are calling, what I like to call experts, what others are calling metaverse um, is not being built that way. And do you guys think there should be something happening? Like should the US government and the West be forming like a W3C something? I know there's little bits going on. I've been talking so about this small. a lot. I've been talking about this a lot. If the most valuable asset in the metaverse is your identity and your backpack or your purse, so to speak, um, I don't know that how anybody would want a company to control that. You know, one of my problems with, with Meta is that they're working on a meta layer, an API that would allow uh, for better teleportation, you know, their version, VR's version of hyperlinks, and uh, also might provide a unified avatar system uh, as well as a unified payment system. Uh, the problem is uh, who's gonna use their API and, and hand to them essentially the most powerful asset in the metaverse. It seems like unlike search, you know, which all ended up in Google's hands, this is gonna be highly diffused for quite some time. I also think the issue with there being one metaverse is that, you know, three quarters of the world is not using the internet that we see. So you have to overcome real physical borders, uh, not just uh, virtual ones. Charlie, do you yeah. see like the web 3.0 work, like the decentralized, uh, technologies like Definity and others, like which are an actual total opposition to like the metas and centrally controlled metaverse. So do you feel like that has a shot? There's something clearly going on that is very big with crypto and NFTs. I'm not sure I completely understand it, to be honest. I'm kind of sitting on the sidelines, reading everything I can, um, but it is very complicated and there's a lot going on. Um, and a lot of different currencies being created for a lot of different purposes. So I don't think this is mature yet. Uh, and I think it's very hard to understand. Uh, those are kind of gonna be obstacles to it. It also has a whiff of tulip mania to it. So there could be a lot of people with thousand dollar tulips when all of this is over that have no particular value other than looking pretty for a few weeks in your backyard every year. So, um, I, I just think it's, it's a very early too. time. I, and I also think, you know, this urge to label things is always kind of hilarious. Um, you know, all of a sudden we're calling web 2.0, web 3.0 because of NFTs. You know, I mean, to me, web 3.0 is that wearable, ubiquitous, persistent uh, extension of the internet, as we've been saying, the next generation of the internet extended into the real world. Uh, you know, and meshing or merging uh, it along the edges in ways that are both uh, obvious and apparent that others invisible. 
But that's certainly that to me is Web 3.0, not the introduction of NFTs and decentralization, which has always been, as you pointed out a few minutes ago, a core concept of the internet. So I don't think we yet have a core concept of the metaverse. I, we have many metaverses, maybe they'll be connected. Some may connect with others, some not. Uh, but that is going to take a long time to play out. You know, I don't think that, that you're going to see Apple or, or Microsoft agree to use anything made by Meta with their systems. So here's, a, here's an interesting question for the both of you, because you're, you're talking about this. And what I'm thinking about, you pose to all our listeners, to the people out there in the world that are touching this and thinking about this. Do we believe, even as part of our brain, that there will be a successful, let's call it the Linux of the metaverse, right? Um, mm -hmm. So this is kind of one of these Jekyll and Hyde problems that, that you and I talk about all the time, Charlie, right? We have commercial aspirations from multiple companies with a layer of the ethics and goal of transportability and interoperability, right? But to your point, because the World Wide Web, ARPANET and all the things that, that allowed us to get there was an open sort of framework built largely by government institutions, military and universities, um, it had a different ethical core, right? And then people mm. layered on top of it with commercial logic. Um, but now we're starting with multiple companies with commercial aspirations first, profit aspirations first, growth aspirations first, and stockholder responsibility first, as opposed to the what an ARPANET was that developed. Right. I, think, so, I think that so, states it really well, and it gets back to what Roni just said, uh, we need sort of the ICANN of spatial computing so that identity can be held um, in you know, a neutral, secure place that has no profit interest. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really what we need. I can't envision how it would come about because it would require the cooperation of everyone. Uh, so you know, I don't know if we live in that world anymore of the you know, late 80s, early 90s, where people would go along with that to make something happen. Um, you know, as you said today, it's commercial interest negotiating with one another, not a bunch of scientists and researchers agreeing to do something when, you know, there were maybe 10,000 people in the world doing it, you know, so easy to get a consensus among, you know, uh, a group like that, which is homogeneous rather than, you know, bringing in the other 9 billion people. What, one of the, what, uh, Charlie and Ted, I, I think my, my response to you guys is a little more Joseph Campbell. I, I think if you strip away the tech, what we're looking at are warlords without naming mm. them. Warlords yes. who want to own massive lands and kingdoms and castles in ways you could not imagine until they get to go to Mars and like become emperors of planets. And I've literally heard the kind of people you're talking about who are worth 100, 200 billion dollars talk about becoming emperors of Mars. I've heard crazy things like that directly from their mouths. So like things you just can't believe that these people actually think. So I feel, I feel like this world we're, we're rushing into has these warlords, it has like shamans, it has commoners. Most people will be serfs working the land for the warlords in ways they don't even understand, but you'll be like, come to my land and here's an acre. And now suddenly you're paying homage to the warlord. And I think there's artisans and prophets and evil wizards and all kinds of stuff. But I feel like those mythical things will actually embody in, in much more fantastical ways, in ways that you can't in the physical world, because this is like a giant digital game world run by kids who are now warlords, who have money, like they're at the leaderboard of having hundreds of billions of dollars, but they still have the mind of an 11 year old. I think most people don't understand one part of their mind is like an 11 year old kid with, with, with the Atari. Like literally, if you spend enough time with these people, you guys have, you, you know what I'm talking about. The other parts like genius level math, computer science but one side is 11 year old kid who wants to play with their gi joes and win all the toys and, and and have the number one score in the video game and that's how they're ruling the world right now they, they're, they're turning the world into one gigantic video game mm -hmm. and the financing like all the people on the outside mm -hmm. the investors have no idea what's going on it's just like money throw it at this buzzword <laughs> it's pretty nuts but I, I feel like if you put a mythical layer like the joseph campbell layer it actually makes a lot more sense what's happening you have the primal instinct of people wanting to be emperors and warlords trying to control as much of these endless 
real estate, endless lands that they can build and charge you when you work for them on their, on their lands and farms, just like medieval times. And then you have a few people who are saying no to that, like let's fight the kings and emperors and have democracy. And those people are constantly under threat and attack. Well, I would say that, yeah. that is a unique description of what's going on. I mean, I, I do think we're also starting to see, you know, some of the edges of where the dark side of this is. And um, that is also pretty scary. Um, you know, when you think about the dark web and what the spatial version of that is, oh, uh, you know, and how that possibly can be controlled. And this is another thing that Meta is doing that, I, you know, really sort of caused a shift in my thinking, you know, they're bringing Grand Theft Auto to uh, the Oculus Quest. And I oh, think yeah. there's something deeply distressed. Look, I'm not saying it should be censored or that they shouldn't do it, but I'm not sure you bring that game into the Quest and then claim you're doing good in the world. Charlie, you know? that was my example when I was talking to investors uh, in early days of Magic Leap of what I would not do. I literally said, I use GTA as the example of so realistic, so scary, so psychologically traumatizing to a young mind. Never do that. That was literally like, if, if yeah. you don't think oh, you're so that's right. okay, don't invest in us. I know I'd say like the line has to be there. Yeah. And we did this thing called invaders, you know, Dr. Gene. I said, that's as far as we should go. If you go beyond that, it should be like training systems for like defense or, you know, like the, the yeah. US Navy or something, but like by the way, I've done, I've done like what that is. Like I've done like the, the, the defense layer stuff, which is like what GTA really will look like. Right. You can't, you cannot claim that you have no responsibility if you unleash that at this level of, of realism. I, I it's so just agree. like, it's terrifying. I don't know what- It's terrifying. And I don't know how it can be controlled because people will just go opt into these private places and, and they could be doing things I wouldn't even mention in a podcast. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, as I've said many times, we are poised to repeat on steroids every mistake we made in, when we were working on the creation of the internet in the 90s. US but in the 90s, we had an that. excuse. We didn't know better. No, no, the U.S. government should intervene. Like, like literally, you can't make the argument that this is not uh, changing someone's brain to the point where, where you are teaching them to be psychotic and doing like, you know, things that we just don't want our citizens to do. Like, it is not a game anymore at that level. It's so intense, right. so disturbing. Exactly. It's not. Stuff. And so when Mark says in his, you know, movie, come keynote, that GTA 5 is one of his favorite games, I thought, holy crow, we are in big trouble here. Because the one guy who is in charge of this thinks it's great. Charlie, we did a, I'll, I'll describe this. We did a hostage rescue thing for a defense thing. I, I can't name who they were, but it was like that in the real world, running from room to worm and, you know, but, but training people to do something like, how do you rescue a hostage? How do you right. teach police not to shoot at someone because of cultural bias and stuff like that, mm -hmm. which actually had a purpose and is controlled right. part of a, like a high level security training program. Right giving that level of realism and i had like flashbacks of like i felt like i was in something for days and weeks you could not separate the memory of that from not being real it was so real and yeah. now you're gonna have kids running around like by the in way call of duty world <laughs> it's not just one brand i mean you really have to have an intercession like the government does need to play a role and say we have to kind of say what's what's not okay otherwise we're going to breed an entire population who whose brain has been rewired in some very disturbing ways. So do you think this is obviously this is a very, very interesting topic of discussion. Uh, and when you talk about forms of entertainment and violence as a area of discussion, it, it, it warrants a lot of high minded multiple tiers of discussions, because, you know, while you guys are talking about GTA showing up in the quest, what I'm thinking about is the culture and the phenomenon of Fortnite which while it has this kind of cartoonish layer, it's a very violent game um, that is marketed and targeted toward children, right? Mm -hmm. And kids play it for hours and hours and hours a day um, and start to feel the reality of that, right? Um, where Minecraft feels a little safer and smarter, but Minecraft even had to kind of fold some of its cards and say, there's sort of a violent combat part of, my, of Minecraft, right? 
Um, and then you start to get into the other forms of what we largely refer to as traditional media and how our culture in the West is so obsessed with guns and violence in media, right? And we accept yes. that way more than sexual content in media. Yes. That you would argue that that doesn't even really make sense from a cultural standpoint that we're so okay with massive weaponry in cinema, right? As entertainment. And can we really draw a line between video game entertainment that largely sort of takes the tenets of that, puts them up on traditional screens and another line that says, now once we put them in immersive environments, do we have to create a different ethical code and a different um, logic? And it's, again, this is one of these very complicated yeah. nuanced problems to solve because there is no one right answer. And you know, many people that, I mean, obviously statistically, many people that play uh, violent video games do not go and do real violence, right? Um, and that's sort of the argument on- But, the those, but those video games are fantasy games. You're killing orcs and dragons. You're not killing other people. Right, but, but many, many, many games by the hundreds of thousands are realistic in nature and you are killing and maiming and destroying other people, other property, other things, right? It's not GTA is one. But Ted, I think when you go from like a PC or phone, which is one level and, may, and hopefully you could distinguish reality to a very high fidelity, immersive reality, that line is, is quite different. Uh, now you see a full-size person, you yeah. see their head exploding and their brain split, and you did that. Your, your brain and your whole emotional system is like now learning. I mean, there's, there's a reason why you can train people to do all kinds of complicated things using these very immersive systems because it's so real. It's totally like true. 95% like the real thing. It's not like playing with a controller in front of your television. It's something totally different. It's psychologically, uh, neurologically not the same. Right, and I, I completely agree with you, but I have this more multi-tiered sort of challenge with it. Before we started recording this podcast, we were talking a little bit about the Galaxy's Edge stuff and the Rise of the Resistance ride. And, you know, turn this off if you haven't seen it or don't want the spoiler, but there's a moment, a, mo a number of moments in the ride where you see the stormtroopers with weaponry, right? It's real, it feels real. And they are pointing weapons and that arguably is even more real than a, a video game, even in virtual reality today, but that is the bastion of family entertainment, right? But Ted, so what you just saw, saw but here's the thing, that ride, which is brilliantly done, that fidelity is where we will be near the end in of this 10 year. years, yeah. And you'll right. be able to do that, not just for 10 minutes, everywhere with a device that's probably okay. under a thousand dollars made by a different man. It'll be that level. That is a precursor of what a real metaverse will feel like. Yes. And that is coming. And that's so high fidelity, real. Neurologically true is the word I use. Yes. Neurologic truth means your brain cannot distinguish anymore the difference. It passes the Turing test wow. of, of reality. And that, that's going to be very, very, I, I would say this, Charlie and Ted, you, you know, whatever your podcast can do, but like you need some ethics boards, you need some frameworks that are beyond the I, label. I agree. The older I get, the more I agree with them. You know, when I started in this business, I was an anarchist and everything should be open and anything goes. And, you know, 30 years later, I'm like, we got to stop this. This is not, you know, we thought that was good. Yes, it's conceptually good unless you live among other flawed men. Look, look, it's a very powerful tool to help shape society in a good way or help create like a clockwork orange, yes. you know, tribes of droogs running around with, with who have no morality, who just feel like they should just kill and, and take everything. So I feel like that split, that decision point, we have this decade to solve it. Yeah. As you I, get into the 2030s, we're already, we're already in the neurologically true era in the 2030s and yeah. we better figure it out this decade. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, well, it's part of why, um, the you know that 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 government regulation. I'm not sure. I don't remember the nomenclature. That the technology companies are not responsible for the media that they um, because they're a platform. They're not a media creator per se, even though right. they are a media creator. <laughs> of course, yeah. they get this sort of weird out. And our yeah. our U.S. government is trying to reroute that now and say that's you know no, we don't buy it anymore. Like right. maybe at the beginnings of this, that made sense yeah. because we needed to give you, and look, this gets into this really interesting argument of freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of-, of right. Where is the line? 
And really does there have to be a line? And I think the answer, which we all agree on, is yes, there has to be a line. I mean, if there is no line, it's going to be chaos and mayhem. And uh, we're, we're going to hurt ourselves on a level that no one really can yet conceive the ramifications of. So the complexities um, are who, who defines that line? Who I know, the, I know. Who do we right. give the power? And the usually power. and usually we punt on something this hard. Yes. Well, but but I would say that we have seen those futures, like writers, like, yeah. you know, the Anthony Burgess, comic writers, they have... They have yeah. shown us what happens if you cross that line too far. Like, yep. you know, the world of Watchmen, the world of Clockwork Orange. Like, like, we've seen what our future looks like if we have no breaks, if we don't have like a protection of minority and protection of ethics. And, you know, you, freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom to manipulate large populations and control them. That's right. something completely yeah. different. Yes. Right. Well it. said. All right. So we've got to wrap up. It's 831. You guys both have hard stops. Roni, I love hanging out with you. Thank you for coming on the show this morning. Thank you, guys. This is fun. Awesome. We'll talk more. Very interesting. All right. Said. Awesome. Have a great weekend, guys. Safe travels. Thank you. Bye. Have a good weekend, everyone.